Well, thank you so much for having me. My, my pleasure. Let me go ahead and put my slides up on the screen so that you can see them. Can you confirm, Elena, that you can see them? Very good. First of all, thank uh, Professor Medvedev for the uh, kind invitation to speak to you today. Uh, uh, I would like to talk to you today about a bunch of myths, things that we think we know, but we don't know, and how to ultimately learn what the true story of metabolic health is. And I loved that both uh, uh, of our my other speakers uh, 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 made comments uh, about this concept of metabolic health. Let me explain to you what metabolic health is by explaining to you two other terms, food science, nutrition, and metabolic health. What is the difference between these three terms? Very simple. Food science is what happens to food between the ground and the mouth. But nutrition is what happens to food between the mouth and the cell. And metabolic health is what happens inside the cell. The problem is that all of the diseases that have overtaken the entire Western world, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, and as we will learn, fatty liver disease, these are all processes that go on inside the cell. Therefore, metabolic health is most important. And nutrition and food science are only important as they inform metabolic health. But we have forgotten that. And that is one of the reasons that we are in this mess now. I will try to dig us out by debunking these various myths and focusing on this one particular disease called fatty liver disease. So let's start with the myths. Now, here's the first myth. Chronic disease is a function of aging. You get old, you get sick. This is not true. You get young, you get sick. And as you can see here, this is data from the United States looking at type 2 diabetes in children, ages 10 to 14, ages 15 to 19. And you can see from 2001 to 2017, an increase in every demographic group for both type one diabetes and type two diabetes. Bottom line, it doesn't matter. The things are getting worse across the board in children. And when children get the diseases of adults, you know something is wrong. Myth number two, obesity is about energy balance, calories in, calories out. And therefore, that is about two behaviors, if you will, too much food in, too, much, too, uh, too little exercise out, gluttony and sloth. That's the myth. But if that's the case, then how do you explain these two phenomena? We're looking here on the left at body temperature uh, in uh, various age groups from, 19, from 1850 to current. And what you can see is that as time has gone on, our body temperature has gone down. Now, how does one explain how body temperature goes down? Body temperature is a function of the heat that is generated by the mitochondria. But if the mitochondria are dysfunctional, then they will generate less heat. And that is what we are seeing consistently. How is this explained by too much eating and too little exercise? In addition, on the right, we have a study where we are looking at changes in weight in laboratory animals held in captivity, not humans, okay? Many, many different species. And what you can see is that the time held in captivity correlates with the degree of weight gain. In other words, there is something affecting animals to gain weight as much as there is us humans. So, Clearly, this is not just behaviors because these animals don't exert those behaviors. Myth number three, obesity is the cause of these chronic diseases. So it's all about whether you get fat. And if you don't get fat, then you don't get sick. Here we have 
a Venn diagram of the entire United States population, 260 million. Notice 42.4% obese, BMI over 30, 57.6% normal weight, BMI under 30. So two mutually uh, exclusive and concentric circles. Okay? Now, the standard uh, thought from the doctors and the nutritionists and the Institute of Medicine and the Surgeon General and the White House and Congress and the food industry is the following. 80% of these obese individuals here, these 86 million people here, they're sick. They're fat and they're sick and they're sick because they're fat. And if they would only just diet and exercise, we could solve this problem. This is untrue. And the reason is because 60% of the normal weight population have the exact same diseases as do the obese. Normal weight people get type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, and fatty liver disease, as I will show you in a moment. Now, it is true they get it at a slightly different prevalence. 60% versus 80%. So obesity is a risk factor. But if normal weight people get it too, how can it be a cause? And I can prove this. Here are, is a CT scan through the abdomen of two equally weighted people. Notice trunk fat, 12.8, 12.8. One is healthy, one is sick. B is sick. And the reason is because B has fat around the organs here, as opposed to A, who has fat in the subcutaneous tissue. And we have a name for this. This is called TOFI, T-O-F-I, thin on the outside, fat on the inside, real medical term, 1,500 Medline citations. So it's not about obesity because normal way people get it too. The fourth myth, and the one we'll spend most of our time on, is chronic disease is due to the fat that you measure when you stand on the scale. Well, if that's the case, then how do you explain this phenomenon? These young ladies here in this picture, and then 30 years later, are now older ladies, <laughs> these are the little women of Loja. They are a founder effect growth hormone receptor mutation. In other words, they are Larone dwarfs who live in Ecuador. And when you look at, and, and you'll notice that they're all obese, right? What you can see is that compared to their relatives who do not have Larone dwarfism, their risk for cancer is zero compared to their uh, uh, wild type. Uh, relatives who have a high risk, their risk for diabetes is zero. Their insulin levels are way lower. Their insulin resistance is way better. They are insulin sensitive. Okay. And you can see that the prevalence of diabetes, the prevalence of cancer, the prevalence of all of these diseases, not uh, related to their obesity. When you look at their biochemistry, Let's look at the right side first. Notice their glucose tolerance is the same as their wild type relatives, but look at their insulin response, much lower despite the fact that they are obese. And on the left, you can see their percent fat is higher, as you can see here, 47.7 versus 41.1. But their fasting insulin is one third as high, four versus 14. And therefore, their HOMA is much better. In addition, here is their LDL. Their LDL is a little higher. But take a look at their HDL, much higher. And take a look at their triglyceride, much lower. So their triglycerides lower, their HDL is higher. How do you explain this when they are obese? Conversely, we have this disorder instead called lipodystrophy. So this is a disorder of too little fat. They have easily visible veins. They have Cushingoid facies. They have 
what's known as acanthosis nigricans, this ridging on the back of the neck, which is a sign of insulin working on the skin. And these people have the worst metabolic syndrome of all, where they need hundreds to thousands of units of insulin to bring their blood glucose down because they have no fat to put their energy in. So clearly these two diseases are completely dichotomous. One, fat and healthy. The other one, thin and sick. The reason for this is because there are not one, not two, but three different fat depots. And these three different fat depots have different functions and different prognostic factors. Now, the first fat depot is the obvious one, the one that you can see from the outside, the one that, you know, is obvious when you, you know, buy a bathing suit, the subcutaneous fat. Okay. Now, this is the way we learn in medical school about metabolic syndrome. We learn you get fat, and because you get fat, you secrete IL-6, TNF-alpha, various cytokines into the portal circulation, which then goes to the liver. The liver then becomes dysfunctional and increases hepatic glucose output here, which then increases the um, uh, glucose level in the blood, which goes to the islet cell, and the beta cell then releases more insulin. And so what you have here is a vicious cycle of obesity and hyperinsulinemia, but it starts with the fat. And then the muscle is along for the ride. This is what we learn in medical school. This is not correct. I will show you why it is not correct. First of all, if you look at people based on their body mass index here on the x-axis, you can see very clearly obese here. Right? And what we have on the y-axis is insulin sensitivity. And what you can see is, yes, there is a relationship, a negative relationship between the two, a hyperbolic relationship. That's true. But for any given BMI, there are patients who are insulin sensitive and there are patients who are insulin resistant. So just because you are overweight does not mean that you necessarily have an insulin resistance problem. This is made even further clear when you look at the incidence of diabetes or heart disease. You'll notice that for any given BMI, the different colors, yes, the different BMI will increase the risk of the uh, disease, whether it's diabetes or heart disease. But the thing that really determines the risk is the insulin sensitivity versus insulin resistance. Those patients who are insulin resistant even if they're normal weight, have a higher risk for diabetes and a higher risk for heart disease than those patients who are obese and insulin sensitive. And you can see here on this Kaplan-Meier curve on the right, that it is not the obesity that determines mortality. Rather, it is the insulin sensitivity versus insulin resistance that determines mortality. In each case, it's the insulin resistance that makes it more likely that you will die. In each case, it is the insulin resistance that makes it more likely that you will get disease. So there are fat healthy people. We call them metabolically healthy obese here, MHO. So what this is, this is a, uh, uh, an analysis of telomeres, the uh, ends of the chromosomes that fray and when the, that happens, then the uh, cells die and then the people die, all right? So the shorter the telomeres, the uh, sicker you are. So here we have metabolically healthy non-obese, thin people. Here we have metabolically healthy obese. Notice they are the same, okay? What's different is when they are metabolically unhealthy obese, then the telomeres are shorter. So in each case, there is a, uh, uh, a, a cadre of patients whose obesity is not affecting their health. So subcutaneous fat, if anything, is protective. Second, we have the next fat depot, visceral fat, okay, the belly fat. Now, normally we think of belly fat as metabolically active fat that when you exercise, for instance, or when you are chased by a lion and have to run away, that this is the fat that is mobilized first. And it is, 
So the adrenergic nervous system releasing norepinephrine, binding then to the beta-3 adrenergic receptor on the adipocyte will result in lipolysis by activation of the enzyme hormone-sensitive lipase, which will then cause uh, fatty acids to uh, be dumped into the bloodstream, which will then go to the liver and be burned either as ketones or moved around the body for fatty acid oxidation. So in the acute situation, acute stress, the sympathetic nervous system results in lipolysis. In addition, you will get increased thermogenesis from brown adipose tissue. And this is all true in the acute stress situation. However, chronic stress is different. Chronic stress generates visceral fat. It doesn't lo lose visceral fat, it gains visceral fat. And the reason is because in addition to neuropeptide, as, uh, as in addition to norepinephrine, those neurons are also releasing this neuropeptide, this neuromodulator called neuropeptide Y. And neuropeptide Y binds to its receptor on the adipocyte, the Y2 receptor, and it basically shuts this down. This is the break on the adrenergic nervous system in order to make sure that you don't lose all of your fat. So this ends up leading to lipid storage. It ends up leading to angiogenesis so that the fat can grow. And so in the face of chronic stress, because of the advent of neuropeptide Y being co-released with the norepinephrine, you end up the exact opposite. Instead of burning fat, you now gain it. And then finally, and what we're going to talk the rest of the, this lecture about, the liver, the liver fat. Now, here we have photomicrographs of two livers. Here we have normal liver, and you can see the sinusoids and the bile canaliculi here and the Kupfer cells, all nice and ordered, all well. And over here on this side, we have fatty liver disease. And you can see the fat vacuoles, and you can see the macrophages moving in, and you can see the start of um, fibrosis here as well. Now, the problem is you cannot tell what caused this. Was this caused by alcohol prior to 1980? If you saw this under a microscope, this was an alcoholic. But today, 25% of children in the United States have this, and they don't drink alcohol. So there is a move afoot to call this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's also a move afoot to call it metabolically active fatty liver disease. Again, metabolic health being the main issue. Well, if it's not alcohol, what is it? And that is where this rest of this talk is going. So in America, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has now overtaken hepatitis C as being the leading cause of liver transplant, as you can see here. NAFLD is a worldwide problem, not just in the United States. So you can see here different countries around the world, and you can see Yes, NAFL prevalence in overweight people, higher. But notice there is a prevalence even in normal weight individuals with a BMI less than 25. So just because you are thin does not mean you are healthy. You might be sick. In fact, if you look here, we have BMIs binned in, uh, uh, on the x-axis versus hazard risk ratio for fatty liver disease here on the y-axis. And you'll notice in the normal weight category, there is a small signal here in the overweight category, a higher signal. And yes, of course, in the obese category, a much bigger signal. But this is even more dwarfed by what's going on with diabetes. So if you have diabetes, you have that signal much higher, even in the normal weight population. In fact, if you have fatty liver, you are 3.5 times more likely to develop diabetes than somebody who does not have fatty liver. So here's how I want you to think of this. This is called an MRI fat fraction map, and it shows up the fat very well. So here is an obese individual with lots of subcutaneous fat. But I want you to take a look at this guy's liver here in red. Notice dark 
2.6% liver fat. This is fine. This is an MHO, metabolically healthy obese. This gentleman will probably outlive you. Now, here we have what you would most likely expect to see. Obesity, of course, but take a look at his liver. 24% liver fat. So this is fatty liver disease. This is metabolic syndrome. Now take a look at this gentleman. Notice no obesity to speak of, very little subcutaneous fat, but take a look at his liver, 23% liver fat. This gentleman is as sick as this gentleman, and he's thin and he's fat. Thin sick, fat sick, fat healthy. So it is not the fat you can see, it is the fat you cannot see. That matters, the ectopic fat, and in particular, the liver fat. And here for adolescents, a new paper that came out showing the relative risk for diabetes, 2.6 if you had fatty liver disease as an adolescent compared to those who do not. So fatty liver disease is the sentinel disease. It is the disease that drives all of the others. And the question is why? What is it about fatty liver? Where does the fat come from? That's really the big issue, is why uh, before 1980, we didn't even have this thing called fatty liver disease. And today, 45% of Americans and 25% of American children, unrelated to weight, have this problem. And of course, lots of people in Russia as well. Well, we have to find the source of the fat. So this was done in 2009. This was uh, Fabrini et al. from Sam Klein's group at Washington University, St. Louis. And what they did was they stuck people in an MRI scanner. And instead of measuring subcutaneous versus visceral fat, they measured visceral versus liver fat. So when they held the liver fat constant, the visceral fat explained none of the metabolic perturbation as demonstrated by insulin kinetics here on the x -axis, uh, y axis however when they held the visceral fat constant the liver fat explained all of the changes in metabolic parameters in other words it's the liver fat that's causing the pathology the liver fat is causing the insulin resistance so where is that fat coming from? As you can see here, it is coming from non-systemic fatty acids. Now, we know where systemic fatty acids come from. They come from the diet or they come from uh, lipolysis of adipose tissue, like in type 2 diabetes. But non-systemic, that's the big one here. Where is that coming from? Well, that is coming from fat that is being made right inside the liver. Now, this study showed that if you have even up to 1.85% liver fat, okay, you can have signs of metabolic syndrome. So the liver was not designed to store fat, and it is now storing fat, and that is why we are all getting sick. I like this uh, saying, sometimes I drink a glass of water just to surprise my liver. So the question is, what are we not surprising our livers with? Okay. And it's certainly not water. So alcohol, of course, but in America in particular, the problem is sugar. And I will show you why as we go. We have to determine what the cause of the toxins that are generating the liver are. Now, in the fatty uh, liver disease literature, people talk about the two-hit theory, that first you get the fat and then you get the inflammation. What I'm here to tell you is that it is not the two-hit theory and it is not the multiple-hit theory. Rather, I'm going to show you that it is the three-hit theory. There are three separate phenomena that are going on in the liver, and I will delineate each of these so that you can understand how each of these build on the previous one to generate this problem and therefore metabolic syndrome. 
So the first hit, the first problem, mitochondrial dysfunction, which leads to liver fat generation, de novo lipogenesis, new fat making. All right. The very first time I had ever heard of fatty liver was when I was a pediatric intern in St. Louis, Missouri in 1980, and I was in the intensive care unit, and I was taking care of a patient with Rye syndrome. This was before we knew that aspirin was the cause of Rye syndrome in children, and they developed severe fatty liver in a very, very rapid time frame, and most of these children died. What you can see is that the driver of that was, was salicylic acid. You can see how the total lipids and the hepatic triglycerides went way up when you incubated uh, cells, uh, liver cells with salicylic acid. And the reason is because salicylic acid inhibits mitochondrial function. And in particular, the, it inhibits this enzyme here, long chain hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase, which is part of the mitochondrial trifunction enzyme generating fatty acid oxidation. So if you don't oxidize your fatty acids, that means you're going to store them instead, okay, or make them. And the bottom line is aspirin is a mitochondrial toxin, and therefore aspirin leads to fatty liver. Pretty much any mitochondrial toxin will lead to fatty liver. Alcohol is a mitochondrial toxin. It leads to fatty liver. Well, guess what? Sugar is a mitochondrial toxin, and it leads to fatty liver as well. This was an article in the New York Times magazine about our research at UCSF called Is Sugar Toxic? And this was our comment in Nature uh, a few months later called The Toxic Truth About Sugar that I wrote with my colleagues from the Institute for Health Policy Studies. What you can notice is that fatty liver disease correlates with things we know are related to sugar, like, for instance, tooth decay and periodontitis. Okay, so this was work done by Jane Weintraub, a public health dentist here in the United States, showing that all of these various dental problems that are related to sugar are also related to fatty liver disease. Now, why does this happen? This is a schematized version of hepatic metabolism of glucose or fructose. And what you'll notice is that for glucose, only 20% of the glucose ends up in the liver. Most of it ends up in all the other organs. And that 20% of glucose pretty much ends up as glycogen, liver starch, which is non-toxic. This is what your liver wants to do with excess energy. Very little of the glucose will make it down to pyruvate, and very little of pyruvate will enter the mitochondria. And so the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, generating ATP and carbon dioxide will not become overwhelmed. And so the mitochondria can do their job. If there's an excess of pyruvate, then the mitochondria basically cannot handle the load it will throw off the excess as citrate here, this process called the citrate shuttle. And then this citrate will then act as the substrate to generate free fatty acids through this process called DNL, de novo lipogenesis. And all of this, of course, is under the control of insulin because insulin's job is to get energy stored. Now, that's what happens with glucose. With fructose, we have a different story. Fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, only the liver can metabolize fructose. So 100% of a fructose load will end up in the liver. And you'll notice no glycogen does not go to glycogen. It comes straight down from fructose 1-phosphate to pyruvate, thus an increased pyruvate load entering the mitochondria. The enzymes in the uh, mitochondria cannot handle the load. Therefore, it will throw off excess citrate, and that citrate now will be acted on by DNL, these three enzymes of de novo lipogenesis, to end up as triglyceride. That triglyceride can either be exported out, and that would be a substrate for uh, uh, obesity or for heart disease, or 
maybe those free fatty acids won't be exported out. Maybe they will precipitate in the liver as a lipid droplet, and now you have fatty liver disease. So you can see that the sweet molecule in sugar, fructose, is metabolized completely differently and at a completely different mass and a completely different kinetics than that of glucose. This was then shown by the group at Joslin Diabetes Center, Ron Kahn's group, uh, Softic et al. And what they did was they looked very specifically at glucose and fructose and mitochondrial beta oxidation, and they localized the problems. So glucose will actually activate two enzymes here in green. They will activate AMP kinase, the fuel gauge on the liver cell, and it will also activate this enzyme here, HADH, hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase, the sum total of which means that beta oxidation will increase. Conversely, fructose inhibits three mitochondrial enzymes. It inhibits AMP kinase. It inhibits this acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain. Remember, that's the same enzyme in, for aspirin. And it will also inhibit this enzyme here, CPT1, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1A, which is the um, uh, shuttle mechanism for getting uh, uh, fatty acids into the mitochondria to beta oxidize in the first place. So you can see glucose helps mitochondria function. Fructose inhibits mitochondria from functioning. Ron Kahn himself famously said of this study, the most important takeaway of this study is that high fructose in the diet is bad. It's not bad because it's more calories. Remember, it's not about calories, but because it has effects on liver metabolism to make it worse at burning fat. As a result, adding fructose to the diet makes the liver store more fat, and this is bad for the liver and bad for whole body metabolism. We at UCSF in San Francisco took 43 children from our clinic with metabolic syndrome. And what we did was we took the sugar out of their diet and replaced it with complex carbohydrate starch. We studied the patients at the beginning and at the end of 10 days. And we assessed what happened to their liver fat and the rest of their uh, fat depots, de novo lipogenesis and their metabolic health. What you can see here is that all the laboratory studies got better just by taking the sugar out of their diet and substituting with starch. Here's their glucose tolerance test. The glucose area under the curve went down by 8% inferring improved glucose utilization. And here's their insulin response. Notice here an insulin resistance curve and here much lower and also clearance improved insulin sensitivity. We also measured how fast the de novo lipogenesis reaction was occurring. We gave these patients C13 labeled acetate to be incorporated into new palmitate development and we could measure the palmitate in the blood. And what we saw was that the rate of this reaction got cut in half when we took the sugar out of their diet and substituted starch. And now the fat depots. So you'll notice these patients did not lose weight because we gave them as much carbohydrate as we took out sugar. So their calories were the same. So no change in subcutaneous fat but a 7% loss in visceral fat and a 22% loss of liver fat because these patients were not engaging in de novo lipogenesis. So in cartoon form, at baseline, fatty liver, lots of triglyceride, lots of VLDL, nine days of fructose restriction, isocaloric, and what we saw was liver fat went down 22%, De novo lipogenesis went down 46%. VLDL went down 49%. Visceral fat went down 7%. And most importantly, their pancreases, whoops, sorry, their pancreases started making insulin properly. We reversed their metabolic syndrome by just getting the sugar out of their diet with no change in calories 
and no change in weight. This has now been corroborated by another group working out of University of California, San Diego and Emory University. In addition, there is another fat that the liver makes that we uh, were looking for called ceramides. So you're familiar with ceramides, it's earwax. Okay, the stuff in your ear. Well, turns out your liver makes earwax too. <laughs> okay, it just doesn't show up as wax in the, in the liver, but it does cause liver dysfunction. And it turns out when we looked at ceramides, okay, this maneuver of getting the sugar out of their diet basically reduced their ceramides across the board. Okay. And it, uh, as their ceramides went down, all of their metabolic parameters improved as in red. So mitochondrial dysfunction, the novo lipogenesis fat deposition, that's the first hit, but there's two more hits. The second hit, reactive oxygen species formation. So anything that increases reactive oxygen species is going to lead to necrosis of the uh, liver and ultimately cause liver fat as well. As you can see here, using the toxin cadmium. And cadmium, as you know, is fa often found in cocoa. All right. And so we uh, others have shown that when you give uh, animals cadmium on a high fat diet, you end up with a whole lot of extra fat down here, as you can see. And it is dose responsive. Well, we're not giving them cadmium, but we're giving them a different reactive oxygen species former. It's called sugar. So here we have five pictures of food. They all have one thing in common. They're brown. This is browning. This is the Maillard reaction. Okay, so the way to think about the Maillard or the browning reaction, which occurs in everyone all the time, is you can roast your meat at 375 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour, or you can roast your meat at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit for 75 years. The answer is the same. We are all browning. And if you don't believe me, uh, what happened here? Uh, these are not my slides. Something very strange going on here. This is weird. Um, I don't not, do not know what is going on. Sorry? Oh, my presentation is over because of time. I, I, no. I don't understand. I, okay, let's see. All right. Let's see if I can make this go. There we go. All right. I don't know what happened there. Um, if you don't believe me about the um, uh, uh, Maillard reaction, here's normal newborn rib cartilage, nice and white. And here's 88-year-old rib cartilage, nice and brown. We are all browning all the time. The reason this happens is because the epsilon amino group of lysine, for instance, on the hemoglobin molecule, will bind to the aldehyde group of glucose, which will form a shift base, which will then lead to a spontaneous de decomposition and de develop this covalent linkage. And we call this hemoglobin A1c. Obviously, diabetics have very high hemoglobin A1Cs because of this reaction. But glucose does this reaction, but not nearly as rapidly as fructose. And the reason is because here's glucose, here's fructose, here's glucose, here's fructose, here's glucose, here's fructose. What you'll notice is they are not the same. Glucose is a six-membered ring. And this hydroxymethyl group up here is not bothering anybody. So this is a happy compound. At pH 7.4, 37 degrees Celsius, 99.2% of the glucose in your body is in the ring form where there's no problem. Only 0.8% is in the linear form where this aldehyde group is available to bind in the Maillard reaction. Now look at fructose, five-membered ring, two hydroxymethyl groups. Here they are, butting heads, they're axial, they're in the same plane, okay? So this is an unhappy compound. 
So at pH 7.437 degrees, 97% of the fructose will be in the ring form, 3% will be in the linear form, and this reactive keto group here is just as reactive as this aldehyde group here. Every time this reaction occurs, you generate a reactive oxygen species, which then has to be quenched or it will lead to cell dysfunction and death. Now, it can happen with glucose, but it can also happen with fructose. And it turns out with fructose, it happens seven times faster. So you will see here, fructose shift base, ultimately leading to oxygen radicals, reactive oxygen species, which will end up reducing the antioxidant in the liver, glutathione. And if you don't have enough glutathione, you will end up with lipid peroxidation, protein denaturation, cell damage, necroinflammation, and fatty liver disease. And I can show you that this occurs more rapidly with fructose in vitro. If you take glucose and protein and you put it in a test tube and you cap it and you put it in the sunlight, this is how fast the reaction occurs. And if you do the same for fructose, this is how fast the reaction occurs. Seven times faster. 100 times the reactive oxygen species. This study showed, uh, this is done in primary liver cells in vitro. What they did was they threw different carbohydrates on the liver cells. And you'll notice that when they threw aldehydes on the liver cells, the cells died at a relatively low concentration, a low ED50. Fructose and glucose, no problem. But then what they did was they took those same liver cells and they treated them with just enough hydrogen peroxide to render them vulnerable, to basically use up their antioxidants. Then they threw these same compounds on them. And now what you can see is now the fructose is as um, uh, powerful as the aldehydes in terms of causing cell death, whereas the glucose was not. In addition, fructose causes increased reactive oxygen species by translocating bacteria and lipopolysaccharides across the intestine, causing what we call leaky gut, by causing dysfunction of tight junction proteins that are basically keeping the uh, intestinal barrier intact. And so by the translocation, you are ending up with uh, reactive oxygen species in the liver, leading to hepatic site death and inflammation. So that's problem number two. Finally, the third problem, the third hit, malnutrition and defective packaging. So there is a model of fatty liver disease called the methionine-choline deficient diet. Now, Methionine is an antioxidant, and methionine is necessary to generate glutathione. So if you are methionine deficient, you can't make as much glutathione, so you will be vulnerable. In addition, choline is necessary to make phosphatidylcholine, and phosphatidylcholine is necessary to make ApoB100 in order to transport fat out of the liver. So if you are low in choline, you will be low in export. So you take patient, uh, sorry, animals, you take rats who are methionine choline deficient, as you can see here on the right, and you treat them with either starch or sugar, starch or sucrose. And you'll notice the starch doesn't do anything. It's the sugar that causes the fatty liver disease. And here's the death of the cells using the tunnel staining. Starch. Not much, sugar, lots. Okay? When you look at the biochemistry of these animals, what you can see is that the body weight has gone up in the uh, sugar-treated animals, okay. The liver has gone up a little bit. The triglycerides have gone up, sure. And the hepatic triglycerides have gone up in the sufficient state. But now let's take a look at the deficient state, okay? Look at the liver weight, much higher, see, 50% higher. Okay, look at the serum triglyceride, lower, because they can't export it out because there's no uh, choline. And if you look at their hepatic triglyceride, it's all in the liver and can't get out. 
and this causes severe liver inflammation as measured by ALT. So we were interested in this. And so what we looked at was what did choline do to our patients? So they would ingest C13 labeled acetate shakes, and we would then measure what happened to their fat in their liver by magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And what you can see, let me, I'll do this for a long time. You don't need that. Okay. What we showed was that there was a, a negative relationship between export and storage. So the more that could be, that, the more that was stored, the less that was exported out. Okay. That's not surprising. Okay. But what was interesting was that when we looked at who was who, turned out the patients who had choline in their livers, high choline on the MRS, showed that they were able to export out, whereas the patients with low choline showed that they had more fat stored. In other words, if they couldn't get it out, that was the reason why it precipitated. And we showed this was not just true in adults, we showed it was true in our children as well. More choline, less liver fat. Less choline, more liver fat. So three separate hits, mitochondrial dysfunction and de novo lipogenesis. That's one problem made worse by sugar. Reactive oxygen species generation and inflammation made worse by sugar. And finally, malnutrition and defective packaging and transport made worse by defective methionine and choline, that is ultra-processed food because ultra-processed food is low in both. So we have proof of causation of sugar and four diseases, diabetes, heart disease, fatty liver disease, and tooth decay. We have correlation for sugar and cancer and sugar and dementia. We're working on those. So remember, we started saying you get fat and then you get sick. No, your liver gets fat and then you get sick. So the fatty liver causes hepatic dysfunction, hepatic increase in glucose output, therefore beta cell hyper, uh, hyperplasia, and then further hyperinsulinemia. So the same vicious cycle that we saw before, except it starts with the liver instead of with the fat, and then the muscles along for the ride. Turns out there are four separate foodstuffs four separate things you put in your mouth that can drive this phenomenon of de novo lipogenesis and metabolic syndrome. Trans fats, branched chain amino acids, alcohol, and fructose. And the reason is because the liver is the only site for energy metabolism. This process is not insulin regulated and there's no glycogen pop-off. So the mitochondria are overwhelmed. This is what I mean by the concept of metabolic health. Mitochondrial health is metabolic health. And anything that causes your mitochondria to not work well will lead to fatty liver, insulin resistance, metabolic dysfunction, and all of the chronic metabolic diseases we've talked about. So this is a grand scheme slide, if you will. Fructose enters, okay, can bind to proteins generating reactive oxygen species. It can enter the mitochondria, generate reactive oxygen species. And of course, fructose can also go to other organs and uh, generate inflammatory cytokines like obesity. And that will uh, increase NADPH oxidase and that will increase reactive oxygen species. So you have this ROS pool in your liver and it has to be quenched. It has to be detoxified. And it does so in the peroxisome. This is where the antioxidants are. This is where the ROSs go to die. But if you don't have antioxidant capacity, then the ROSs end up here in the endoplasmic reticulum, activate what is known as the unfolded protein response. You can't fold your insulin molecule. You have insulin deficiency. You can't fold your insulin receptor molecule. You have insulin resistance, and it leads to cell death, and metabolic dysfunction. In addition, you end up with lipid droplets because of the fatty acyl CoA, and that causes insulin resistance as well. This is a 
poster that we, uh, my colleague, Dr. Alejandro Gugliucci and I developed, which you can get by um, uh, 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 online from Biotechni. This is a, 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 a uh, reagents company, and they put this together. And what you can see here is that the liver is the central factor in terms of all of these other organs and what is going on in metabolic syndrome. And this is free. All you have to do is go on the Biotechni website and you can uh, uh, have it sent to you for free. And then the question is, what do you do about this? Well, there is no medicine for this. The only options are reduce the substrate availability, that's called no sugar, reduce the hepatic flux, that's called high fiber, improve the transport, that's called choline, and increase the clearance, that's called exercise. Diet and exercise, just for a different reason, not because of calories, but because of these phenomena. So processed food is an experiment that failed. Processed food is what led to this because of the high sugar, low fiber. So that leads us to the very last myth that weight loss is the treatment for all of this. The American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists published this about fatty liver. And what they said was, while no FDA approved medications to treat NAFLD are currently available, and that is true, Management can include lifestyle changes that promote an energy deficit leading to weight loss. So it's only about weight loss because they think it's only about obesity. It's not. It is about protecting the liver. It is about feeding the gut. And it is about supporting the brain. We call this the metabolic matrix. Protect the liver from sugar, feed the gut with fiber, support the brain with omega-3 fatty acids, and then you have metabolic health. Hippocrates famously said, let food be thy medicine. Yeah, well, Hippocrates never met McDonald's. If he had, he might have said something more like this. Good food is medicine. Bad food needs medicine. Bad food is the cause of these chronic diseases. And you have bad food in Russia the same way we have bad food here in America. And we're all getting sick because of it. And sugar is public enemy number one. Used to be trans fats, now it's sugar. And we need to do something about it. With that, I will thank my collaborators here in San Francisco and also in Washington, DC. And I will be very happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.